welcome to Two Boomer Women. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. I've been talking with Boomer Women for almost a decade now. (laughs) Well, I guess I've been talking to Boomer Women all my adult life. Uh, Reinventing myself several times along the way, though, but always focused on us, Boomer Women. With this incarnation of Two Boomer Women, I'll be interviewing other women who have a message of interest for our demographic. If you want to hear about or learn about something specific, let me know and I'll find someone who understands us to talk about it. There's a contact page at twoboomerwomen.com. If you want to be a guest on Two Boomer Women, bring it on. There's an application form at the website, too. Finally, this show is all about conversation. We women know its value. We know how to do it, and we must perpetuate the art form. So let's get started with today's show. Welcome to the Two Boomer Women Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. Happy New Year, and hopefully you survived all of December's festivities. It's a new year, ripe for opportunity for new beginnings. I am not, however, talking the next big thing, the newest fad to get you where social media has convinced you you should be going. In December, as we ended out 2021, my guests had great information on creating your life of choice as we start this new year whether that was wellness or understanding forgiveness or taking steps to realize your dream of becoming a boomer-style digital nomad. Today's guest holds three fundamental truths. The future can be changed. You can change your future. I'll admit I hesitated on that one because I didn't know whether to say you can change your future. You can change your future. You can change your future. It's you. You can change it. You can change your future. Okay, thank you. And you can start now. Sounds to me like the ideal guest as we embark on a new year, determined not to make more resolutions, but wanting to take positive steps towards a meaningful mm, third act, retirement, rewirement, whatever you want to call this age we're at. Now, my guest will certainly tell her own story, but when I read her words on her website, and I quote, I know what it is to face tough odds, from having a speech pathologist tell my parents that I'd never speak correctly, to overcoming the odds of my abusive childhood, to when a doctor told me that, with the illness I was facing, I only had a 3% chance of recovering and that my days of being an athlete were over. Well, I figured she knew a thing or two about overcoming obstacles. Any one of those things spells grim, but she's here, and she's smiling. (laughs) Bobby Kaler, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you for having me as your guest. I'm going to jump right in 3%. You're obviously still here. (laughs) Yeah. And that was way back in 2003 when I was told that. Wow. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was tough to hear at the time. I mean, I was sick. I I had collapsed. And then it's interesting because after that doctor, um, I had other doctors who have told me they're they're like, I I can't explain how you're still alive. But it was funny, Agnes, when he said, I'll never forget that doctor. And he was a very kind man. But when he told me that, you know, my first, my first question back to him was, okay, but when can I go for a run again? (laughs) And and he just looked at me and he said, Bobby, he said, I think you might have to accept that your days of being an athlete are over. And there was just something inside me that thought, no. And, 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 and it was interesting because my, he's now my husband, Rick, but because my boyfriend at the time when we went home that day, we're sitting in the living room and we're kind of digesting that, you know, the 3%. And Rick said, wow. He said, it's, it's really not fair. And I said, you know, it doesn't matter if it's fair or not. It is. This is what I have to deal with. And I think that that was one of the gifts from that experience, because before that I was one of those people I would argue with what is and think about all the time and energy and effort that we waste. And once I was sick, I didn't have the extra energy. I, I couldn't worry about that because it was like, well, to me, when I heard that with a 3%, it's like, well, okay, so 3% of the people have this answer. How do I find those 3%? Ooh, that's a good attitude. You know, and it's funny because I've had people ask me, well, why didn't you get discouraged when you heard that 97% of people wouldn't experience a recovery? And I, and, and the first time someone asked me that, I thought, but that's not what I heard. I heard 3% would. And that's what I focused on. When you mentioned your doctor saying, I don't think you understand, 
my thought was, I don't think you understand statistics. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. Well, yeah, there we go. That, that just describes Bobby Kaler. <laughs> it really does. I don't know if that's hard headed. I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh dear. Well, Rick obviously, uh, can put up with it. That's right. <laughs> so you've been a speaker and a trainer for more than 20 years. Yep. You're an avid road cyclist and cross country skier. Oh, yeah. So that's sort of like going from, I, I know you were an athlete before, but from one extreme to the other. Can yeah. you share some of that journey, like your journey back, please? Yeah, absolutely. And it's ironic. I was 37 when I, when, when I, when I got sick. I'm 55 now. And I was a good athlete before, and I'm doing things now that I didn't even know were possible back then. Like, I mean, with the road cycling, because I live right at South Rocky Mountain National Park, I'm riding up mountain passes. People pass me in their car, and then and there's lookout areas up at the top of the mountain. And then, then I ride my bike up, and they're like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe you made it. And the one guy, he was, one guy was so funny. He's like, I barely made it in my car. I don't know how you did it on a bike, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, but it wasn't a fast journey. It was not a fast journey at all. The first five years of it, well, the first probably two years was finding a doctor who, 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 who could help me. Because the one doctor who told me about the 3%, he's like, I don't know what Western medicine can offer you. And he said, we, we don't have the answer. And that was a little bit discouraging. And so I kept trying things. And then it was 18 months in when I found a doctor, she was a naturopath an integrative medicine doctor. And she said, I've seen this before and I can help you. And she said, it's not fast. It will take at least two years. And it's like, okay, well, two years, I'm going to be two years older either way, hopefully. So <laughs> let's get it going. And so the first five years, I'd say, because I had a few setbacks, that was really about getting to a place where I was no longer sick, where my, my numbers were back in the healthy range. And actually, that's when the more painful part of the journey began, because there's a big difference, and I learned this one the hard way, between not being sick and really being well and healthy. And so, yeah, I was no longer sick, but think about it. You spend the majority of five years recovering, like, and many of those days I was in bed for, you know, I'd, I'd get up in the morning and my first thought was, when can I go back to bed? Because I was so tired. And some days I couldn't get out of bed at all. Rick brought me my food. And so you lose a lot of your strength, a lot of your stamina. And so the next five years was really getting back to a place of really being healthy. And it, it was a long journey. I remember one point where the one doctor said, okay, you can start going for walks again. My first walk was to the end of the driveway, which was like 20 feet long. And before that, I'd been a runner before I got sick. And I used to go for an eight mile run every other day and think nothing about it. So to go for a walk that was 20 feet <laughs> was like, are you serious? And, and it was funny because I got to the end of the driveway and I could feel the sweat running down my back. That's how hard my body was working. And every day I added distance and I got up to six blocks. And this was a real turning point too, because I, I made it six blocks, which was like a victory. And there was a church there and I'd always sit on, on the steps of the church and I'd rest and then I'd walk back home. And it was a day in October. And uh, I was so, I felt so discouraged because I was thinking I used to be able to run eight miles every other day. And this is now my big achievement going for a walk that's six blocks. And it was like one of those moments where I felt the universe or God or whatever was talking to me. Cause it was like, it doesn't matter what you used to be able to do. All that matters now is what do you do today? What are you willing to do today? That's all that matters. And that brought me some peace and it kept me focused. Cause it was, it was a 10 years is a long journey. But it was, it was staying focused on what can I do today, looking at my progress. Because every day, if I went for six blocks plus two steps, that's progress, <laughs> you know? But it, it, it was really just staying present with that, not pushing too hard, which was a big hurdle for me. Because I've always been one of those people I can push through anything. And this was one of the scariest moments, Agnes. One of the, the one doctor who said that she could help me. I remember at one point I said, you just tell me what to do because I can push through anything. And she stopped and she looked at me over her glasses, you know, she lowered them <laughs> and she's like, that's exactly what made you sick. And what made you sick will not make you well. And that was like, well, what do I have? That's my key strength. Now what? 
you know? So, so it was that, and really just learning about self-care, like it's not selfish. It is caring for your body, right? If you like, if you love yourself, why wouldn't you care for this body that you've been given? And, you know, Rick and I, it was right shortly after the diagnosis, we weren't married yet. And I said to him, it was a couple of days afterwards. And I said to him, I said, you know, I know that this isn't what you signed up for. And, uh, if it's, if you want to walk away, I would totally understand. And, and he just hugged me and he said, no, we're in this together. We'll find our way forward together. And, uh, so it was, I don't know, it, it, an odd experience, but a, a great learning experience at the same time. The, the other thing I'm hearing there too, is if a goal is so important, then if it doesn't happen this month or next month or this year, that's right. You keep on going. I mean, you're talking 10 years, 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. But now I'm doing stuff that wasn't even possible before I got sick. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because the other piece of that is when, when that doctor said, you know, your days of being an athlete are over my first rea- reaction and response inside was no, I am an athlete. Mm-hmm. I will always be an athlete. I don't, I know I'm not right now. I don't know what it will look like. And I didn't know it at the time, but one of the reasons that's so important is because after getting sick, I went on and got my grad graduate degree. And there's a model of human change that Richard Boyatzis is the researcher who, who founded it. And it's been studied thousands of times. It's called the intentional change theory. And it starts with that positive aspirational vision of ourselves. And without knowing it, that's what I tapped into my ideal self. Because at least part of my ideal self, I am an athlete. And so I continued over the years. I never lost sight of that. Didn't know what it was going to look like, but I knew that that was going to, that was important to me and it kept me going. It was motivating. I got a feeling we're going to come back to this. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Okay. So our audience is boomer women. Mm -hmm. By the time a person reaches their fifties, their sixties, their seventies, the best of intentions and desires often still can't provide the oomph to take the first step. Mm. Sometimes even, you know, considering changing things up is exhausting. Ah, that's right. Um, what, what do you say to those women? I think maybe you've already just said part of it, but. Uh... Yeah. So a couple things. The first thing that comes to mind is nothing happens without some kind of action. And I don't care how small that action is, right? But some action that will get us moving. Because once that happens, I I call it learn your way forward. And there's three components to it. It's and and they all start with A's because I like things that are simple so I can remember it. (laughs) But it starts with action. So so act. And then the second step is to assess the action. What did I learn? Right. And then from there, what do I need to adapt? But if we do that, we're continually learning our way forward. And it takes, what I like about the learn your way forward is sometimes I think what keeps people from embarking on change or a journey like that is I don't have all the answers right now. I don't have the whole plan. I don't have the whole vision. That's okay. Some people are visionary and they know those things. There's a lot of us, that's not how we're wired and that's okay. But that trust that we can get started and learn what we need along the way. So that's one piece. The second thing you said, sometimes there's, it's exhausting even considering getting started. And I think part of that, because I've coached, I've coached more than 3000 people at this point in my career. And it, it's not uncommon that people feel that way. And I think part of it is we put this pressure on ourselves that, you know, we have to change versus I often ask people, how about if you experiment with it, with a new behavior? I'm not asking you to change, right? You're not asking yourself to change. You're just saying, I'm going to try something and see how that goes. Do I like it? Was it good? Does it not fit? It's just, it's just an experiment. And there's something about framing it that way that takes the pressure off of it. I, I have points that I want to talk to you about, but I keep on going to what I am now in my brain calling the Bobby Kaler method. Me- method. Oh, no. <laughs> now I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just literally, you know, like if you need to get healthier, 
if you need to incorporate more activity into your life, start with the end of the driveway. Yeah. You know, like you don't have to go out and, and run a marathon. And yeah. also, you know, that just that, that whole experiment thing of, you know, like if you do get out there and you realize that you hate it. That's right. There, there might be some some other way to get to the destination. Is that possible? Absolutely. And that's the beauty of it. You know, that's the real beauty of it. And here's the thing too. If someone had said to me, you know, 20 years ago when I was lying in bed and I couldn't even sit up on my own, if someone had said, oh, you know, you should have a vision to go ride your bike up a mountain pass. I think I might've slapped them. <laughs> you know, why are you talking like this to me? Cause that was so far outside what I thought. I didn't, I didn't even know if that, I didn't know it existed. How would I know it was possible? But it's this continual cycle of, 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 of learning and improving and adapting, you know, and one of the things I, I want to say too, on the, um, the experiment, and I learned this because I, I love cross country skiing. I grew up in the Midwest where everything's really flat. And now I live out here in the Rockies, nothing's flat. And so I have a little bit of a fear on going downhill, especially on two sticks on the bottom of my feet. And, <laughs> And what someone told me, and it was a ski instructor, they said, you have to try something at least three times before you can evaluate whether or not you like it. You know, I mean, obviously, if you touch a hot stove, you don't have to touch the hot stove, you know, three times that you don't like it. And, and I asked this person, I'm like, well, why? Tell me more. And he said, the first time you go down a hill, you're just proving to yourself that you can do it without, you know, something fatal happening. And because that's always the fear. I'm going to, you know, crash and I'm not going to survive. And he said, so the first time is just to prove that you can do it. The second time is to prove that the first time wasn't a fluke. And the third time, now there's a sense of normalcy. Now you can begin to evaluate what I really think of that experience. You know, I think about a friend of mine, she was going to take dance classes and um, she was, God, she was in her fifties when she did it. And the first time she felt so uncomfortable. And she's like, oh, I didn't like it at all. I'm like, what didn't you like? She goes, I didn't know anybody. I'm like, well, if you keep going, are you going to know some people? And she's like, yeah. So she went the second time. She's like, you know, it's better. But the third time she was hooked. Hmm. But we often make that, we often make our decision based on the first time. So I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Every once in a while when I'm talking to my guests, I, I have this aha uh-huh moment about my own life. And, and I just had one as you were speaking insofar as, um, I, I am less so now, but I used to be uber fit and my brother's a runner and he uh. used to encourage me to run and I hated running. I hated running, <laughs> but there was a kajillion other things I loved doing that were all fitness oriented that all kept me at peak performance. I just hated running yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so it's the same thing. It's just like exact same thing. Yeah. 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 Now, Often a fallback is I'll start after I lose 25 pounds or oh. there's a lot going on right now. I'll start in the new year. Well, ta-da, <laughs> here we are. It's a, new, it's a new year. That's right. How do we manage, I almost said you, um, manage the just wait voice that discourages us from taking action? Yeah. So the first thing we have to understand and, and I call it the just wait voice because it's exactly as you described it, right? It shows up like, you know, and it's just trying, it's it, essentially, it's trying to get us to wait, to take action. The first thing is to understand why that voice is even there. I think of that voice as a misguided friend because what it's trying to do, the brain likes safety, right? So if we don't change anything, it feels really safe. And, and so the brain, it's, it's just the brain's way of trying to keep us, to try to keep us safe. So to, to, so to acknowledge it, that's number one. Hey, it's there. That's why it's there. The second thing is to not start debating with that voice. Because sometimes, you know, we start trying to rationalize or debate the voice or whatever. Don't do that. Because once we do that, the voice is one. Because what's the goal of the voice? To keep us from taking action. To keep us safe. So just know that it's there right? We all have that going on in our heads. And it's like, you know, kind of saying, thank you. Now, here's where also that voice can give us good data. If I am standing on top of a ski run and I feel fear, it is good for me to pause and say, okay, 
do I actually have the skill to navigate this? Right. And if I don't, then that fear is a good thing. Right. It's telling me you're not ready for this yet. Um, and I actually had that happen a couple of years ago. I was standing on top of one and Rick was with me and I said, I don't think I'm ready for this. And he said, I think you could do it. But he said, it might be just a step beyond. And I said, you know what, then I'm going to prepare so I can be ready for it. So just, just accept it as data. But yeah, the, I'll, I'll, it's almost like the I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I lose the 25 pounds. I'll be happy when this happens. Just again, it comes back to just starting. You know, don't, don't keep like putting our dreams on hold. And that's why sometimes when people are in that, in, in that, that place, I'll say, what is the simplest action you can take? And, and it's funny because I'm going through this new habit that I'm forming for myself right now. Because a lot of times you think, well, I want to go out, I want to go out and I want to work out. And a workout is an hour, let's just say. And, and that's the best. So if I can't do that, I can't do anything. It's, it's, it's binary thinking, yes or no. So I have a new thing of it's good, better, best. I don't have an hour, but what do I have? I have 20 minutes. What can I do in 20 minutes? So I think if instead of thinking it has to be like this perfect monolithic thing, what if it's just, okay, I can't do that today, but I can, I can go for a 20 minute walk. Guess what? If you do a 20 minute walk every day, what's going to happen to your health? Right. And you've just drawn a parallel there between the end of the driveway and a shorter time period yeah. or gaining a skill before you tackle the big, the big hill. That's right. And so same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now I don't want anybody to think that, you know, it's just easy peasy because we've talked about it. No. Um, what are the, some, some of the, <laughs> <laughs> it just goes, I it's heard easy. it on podcasts. It's easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What are some of the mistakes that people make when they're starting something new? They put a lot of pressure on themselves, right? Mm, okay. And it's almost what you just alluded to, Agnes, in terms of the, well, I heard it. It should be easy. No, it, it doesn't. It isn't necessarily easy. So we, we put way too much pressure on ourselves and then that will shut down our motivation. So I really think giving ourselves grace as we're starting something new. So, so that's one of the things, way too much pressure. I think also we think we have to have the big, complete vision and plan. And sometimes, and I alluded to that earlier, sometimes we don't have that. Sometimes it's just get started and learn your way forward. And, and, and I've seen a lot of people who will say, well, I don't have the whole plan, so I can't get started yet. Not true. You can get started. And then I think it's allowing our, our self-doubt or our, our, our self fears, like the, what will other people think? Mm, or, you know what I mean? Or what if I fail or, or any of those things? And I, I've coached a lot of people and every person thinks that they're the only person that has that, those fears. We all have those fears. Each and every one of us, we all have those fears just to know that's normal. That makes us human. It doesn't make us weak. It doesn't mean that we can't achieve what we want to achieve. It just means we're human, you know, so really just kind of, I guess, embracing that instead of fighting it or, or feeling bad about it. Now, we just had a good laugh over. I heard it on podcast, <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm thinking, too, well, you know, Bobby talked about that and, you know, Agnes agreed. Uh, you can't compare yourself to other people. No. Is that? Oh, absolutely true. Absolutely true. And here's the other thing. I just heard this recently on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Love podcasts. <laughs> but, it, but it was so true. He said, and now I'm blanking on which podcast it was, but the person said one of the key mistakes we make is that we compare ourselves from when we're starting to someone who's already 10 years down the path. Right? That what a colossal mistake that is. You know, because I remember like the first time I went out for to go biking when we moved up here, I rode one mile. I almost collapsed. It was incredibly slow and I was still not fully recovered yet. So it, I mean, I, I went back and I was probably in bed for, for a day. That was just, so if I had compared myself then to the people who were biking mountain passes, I never would have gotten back on the bike. 
And that's something I had to remind myself because, you know, people would pass me left and right <laughs> when I first started. And it's like, I would, I would, I would tell myself in those moments, that's okay. They probably don't have the starting place that I did. They're probably 10 years a lot farther along on their journey. So really keeping that in mind, don't, don't compare yourself to others and certainly recognize if someone else has been doing something for five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever that might be, of course, they're going to be farther along, but you can use that as inspiration for if I stick with it for 15 years, where can I be? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and especially as you just said, 10 years to, to get to even a place where you could start to really excel. Yeah. 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 Now I want to go back to your learn your way forward. Okay. So the three A's, could you just remind me, please? Yep. So it's act. So take an action and it can be a simple action. Mm -hmm. After you take the action, you want to assess how did that work? Did it work? How did it work? Did it not work? Why didn't it work? But just really assess it. And then the third thing is to adapt, you know, and it could be like, hey, that worked pretty well. I want to make a minor tweak and I want to keep going. So those are the three A's. And just as listening and really focusing uh, on that, it could almost go with anything in life. Anything. Yeah. Yep. When I decided to start my podcast, it was in July of 2020, and I thought, I know absolutely nothing about doing podcasting. I'm a coach, and I know how to facilitate, so I think I should be able to have a conversation. You know, that's what was going for me. <laughs> Everything else was not. But I'm like, you know what? I'll learn, I'll learn my foot way forward with it. Right. You know, it, it can be applied anywhere. Good thing you didn't compare yourself to me because I was a natural. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'll delete that part out of this. <laughs> no, that's funny. That's awesome. Okay. Um, I want to talk about personal relationships. Okay. If you don't mind. Your sure. husband is obviously super supportive. You're both on okay. the same page in many areas. Many boomer women have been married for 40 plus years and it's not that their husbands are actively unsupportive. It's almost like they're a supportive. That's oh, not even a word, uh, but they're just, they're just mean. not tuned in anymore. Okay. Now that said, some husbands have just settled into a lifestyle and they don't want their boat rocked. And same thing with kids. Uh, Mum means Sunday dinner, uh, a guaranteed yep. babysitter, an ally, no matter what. Uh, we don't want to jeopardize any of that. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure if this is your bailiwick, but can you? talk us through anything to do with family sabotage man i'm very lucky with rick i haven't always been that lucky when i was in my late 20s early 30s i found myself in a a pretty unhealthy relationship and had we stayed together i well it, it would have it was more than apathetic it would have been destructive so i, I consider myself very lucky there there are times with my family where it's not like they're against me. I don't, I, that's not it. It's just more like you're saying, like the, the a supportive, <laughs> like where's the support? Is there a support? And that can be really hard. And I think what I come back to in those times is what's important to me and really finding a way for that to still exist and, and, and being true to that. Now, now with Rick and I, we've put a ton of work into our relationship. And one of the things that he often gives praises me for, and most people don't, <laughs> is he'll say, you have a willingness to put something on the table to discuss that might be uncomfortable. And it comes from my belief that if we don't discuss it when it is uncomfortable, it grows. And then it becomes more than uncomfortable. It becomes destructive. And so I think that that is one of the things that has helped us a tremendous amount is, is, is both of us being willing to, in a calm way, put it on the table and say, hey, this is something important. Let's talk about this. And one of the things that Rick and I did, this was back in 2009, I think it was one of the most valuable things we did we did a vision board together Ooh. and it was, what do we want out of the next 10 years? And, and it was really powerful because it was a way that both of us got our stuff represented 
And then we thought about how, how do we, it became, it was a we, not a, not a me or a him. It was a we. And, and that was the power of the vision board. It really brought everything that we both wanted into the same picture. What I think I'm hearing too is that as well as the we, if something's important enough to you, then he will acknowledge that and that's right accept it yeah 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 and so and i'm very lucky because he also will support it i mean yeah. it's not just like he doesn't just tolerate it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think we had we had a neighbor once and the wife wanted the dogs and the husband apparently didn't and he wouldn't even walk the dogs he's like well she wanted the dogs they're her dogs and i'm like you can't walk a dog occasionally. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> really? This is so hard, but I, I guess it is. I guess it is sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting when you talk about specifics, some of the, the things that do come into mind about relationships, but yes. you know, and I, I guess boomer women, if you have been married 30 or 40 years, time. yeah, you've got to really express that and say, this is really important to me and perhaps reassure that it's, you're not bailing on the marriage. You're just trying to improve your That's health, right. whatever, you know, it's. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and to your point, it's, it's nothing about the marriage. It's not, you know, not necessarily anything about the marriage. Here's a concept that blew my mind and it's helped Rick and I, and I don't know. It's when I was in grad school, we st- one of the professors talked about how we co-create situations. And up until that point, it was always like, well, you know, a situation happens and it's his fault (laughs) or whatever. And, but I remember like that, that concept blew my mind and, and I, and I was talking to Rick about it. And then shortly after that, it was Christmas day where we were remodeling our bathroom our one and only bathroom for some reason on Christmas day. I have no idea what we were thinking. And we ended up, it was over Christmas dinner. We got into a fight and I'm like, of all the things we didn't want this to happen. And, uh, that notion of co-creating the situation popped back into my head. And I remember I I pushed back from the table and I just said, Rick, I know that neither one of us, neither one of us wanted this outcome today. Not at all. And I said, I'm just wondering, I'm thinking about co-creation, how we co-created it. And I wonder if it'd be good for us to talk about that. And I led with, here's how I co-created the situation. And that led him to talk about what he had done to co-create the situation. There was no blame. And it was afterwards, we're like, wow, that was really powerful. It really worked. (laughs) But I think what worked there is we had talked about it before. But that's something that we have gone back to many times. Like, okay, so this is not what we wanted. How do we co-create it? Because then there's no like, well, you did this and you did that. And, you know. An example that's totally unrelated to relationships that, that really was brought to my mind recently was I belonged to a group of women walkers. And one woman got a text saying, wait for me, I'm stuck in traffic. And she started laughing and saying, I guess this is probably not the right time to text back and say, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. (laughs) <laughs> and you know you right. you have co-created this jam and uh right it really it really hit home that in this case it was traffic but in so many other ways you know, you blame what's out there you blame everybody else or you blame that other person across the table um, right and uh yeah hmm. that's a good one you're not stuck in traffic <laughs> you are tra- that's probably good that she didn't say that at the time yeah right <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. <laughs> well, up here, the, the the other woman who was in traffic was creating traffic would have been arrested oh. for actually being on her gadgets. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bobby, you are an inspiration, and I'm sure if you ever find a way to to bottle that, you'll have people lining up to uh, to buy. What haven't I asked you about personal growth, transformation, in terms of boomer women? Do you have any tips for consideration that we haven't? talked about i think it it comes back to the three fundamental truths which ironically started on a new year's eve for me way way back in the in the day because oh. my life i was kind of treading water you know mm-hmm. and, and i won't go into that story but but it, but it comes from this it was a dark place at that particular time and what i've come to realize is that when we're in that place and we feel stuck or we feel i don't know 
we don't know what to do next. That can feel kind of hopeless or it can feel like a place of despair. And, and, and what I'd say to that is, and from my own life experience and from studying the science is that I believe that action is the antidote to despair. And it doesn't matter how small the action is. And I know we've talked a lot about that, but, but, but as soon as we start taking action, hope gets activated or, and, and I think it becomes very circular. So, so just finding that smallest action that we can take and, and using that as a springboard forward is, is I think what I, what I, what I'd leave it with. Yeah. Um, I, I guess too, like to, to bring it right in, <laughs> when you think about the times on a really small scale that taking, and I guess I have like 2000 apples in my backyard. I don't know what to do with. And I found, I found, (laughs) this is sort of totally off topic, but I've found a few recipes that are like, Oh my God, where do I start? (laughs) But as soon as you do start and uh, you know, I'm obviously breaking it down to the lowest common denominator by talking and uh, a recipe is by, by saying, okay, like I've just got to take, follow this first line, this first sentence and the rest will happen. Um, yeah, you know, and perhaps That's just a perfect example. Well, and I guess just my my example is just sort of for people to remember in their own lives what tiny little thing, you know, whether it's painting the bathroom or a recipe or buying a new design on shoes or like who knows, but it could be anything. Yeah, you know, I saw this Agnes with with my mom. She was in the last year of her life. She was in her early seventies. And she, we, we knew that it was probably terminal. And she also had some cracks in some of the vertebrae in her back. So she's in horrible back pain. And the doctor said to her, he's like, Kathy, if you can get out and if you could walk, even just, you know, I, I don't know, hundred steps, 200 steps a day. I don't know what it was, but he said, it's going to help your pain. And here she is at 70 in a situation where she knew she's probably not going to turn things around but this woman was out there walking rain shine didn't matter and she this is before we had the step counters right (laughs) so she's out there to herself one two three she made it up to a thousand steps in a day wow and and it's just and and what the doctor said is we don't know but it probably improved her quality of life that she had left and it probably extended the time that she had left and 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 that's I don't know. I, th- I think that's part of my inspiration for that too. I was just thinking now we know where Bobby Kaler came from. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> okay. So let's talk Bobby Kaler for a moment. You've written a okay. book. You have a podcast. Yes. Mm-hmm. Tell us more. All right. So the book came out, oh my gosh, 2010. As a matter of fact, it was called travel. It is called travels of the heart, developing your inner leader. And it's meant as it has journaling activities So there's, I set it up in a structure where it's story-based and then there's reflective questions. And I did that because it's, it's a highly effective way that people can go through change for themselves. And it's set up around a model of emotional intelligence. So that's the book. It's still available on Amazon, which is awesome. And then I have a podcast called Unyielded, Thriving No Matter What where I do interviews with people that I, you know, I'm lucky enough to have on the show. And I'm really excited about this part. I just recently launched a second segment called Rise and Thrive. And those come out on Monday mornings. They're under 10 minutes. I've challenged myself, but they all have to be under 10 minutes, but it's something to help people rise above whatever it is they're facing and thrive. Because I believe that we can all do that. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's my book and my podcast. Well, as you can well imagine, I'm all about podcasts and I'm, <laughs> I'm really trying to convince more boomer women to tune in. So especially yeah. that speaking of small starts, that rise and thrive, you know, 10 minutes on a Monday yeah, morning. What 10 a minutes great, or less. Yeah. What a great way to start the week. Yeah. And actually I had one just, well, it would have been in November or October where it was on when you're starting new habits, a simple way to start a new habit where you're um, it, it, it's just an effective way to start. So is that 10 minute segment part of your unyielded or is it yet another podcast? 
it, it's it's all under unyielded, okay. but just look for the rise and thrives. Good. And they're all under, and I've challenged myself, nothing more than 10 minutes. Because I think on a Monday morning, we want to hit we want to hit the ground running and have some inspiration and some practical action we can take. Hmm. You've just given me a great idea. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna wait till this one's uh, sort of archived a wee bit, and then I'm gonna no, I'm not gonna start it. I'm not going to <laughs> steal your idea. No, people <laughs> need it. It's great. Yeah, yeah. So where do listeners find you on the World Wide Web? All right. So it's it's just bobbykaler.com. And do you want me to spell that or will you put it in the show no, notes? No, it's going to be in the show notes. Perfect. So yeah, I'm bo- at bobbykaler.com. My podcast, you can find there. And again, it's that's just unyielded thriving no matter what. Excellent. Okay. So yeah, yeah that, that those will be in the show notes for sure. Uh, along with a link to your book, then it's on Amazon or, or is that, a, is there a link on your website? I think there is a link. There is a link on the website. Plus it is on Amazon. And um, the other thing that I do have on the website, there is a, it's, it's called a seven day challenge, mm-hmm. you know, so if, if, and it's totally free. So if people want, at least at this point, it's free. If people want to get started, on something new, it's there for them. And I'll tell you what, if by the, t- when this airs, if it's, you know, we can find a way so it can be free for your listeners. Let's just coordinate that. All right. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Happy new year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Listeners, if you're ready, determined to change up something in your life this year, you've been listening to the person who can help. Visit Bobby's website, download her free guide to exposing the just wait voice. And check out that podcast, um, especially Monday mornings. <laughs> uh, if you have comments on today's episode, leave them where you're listening or at twoboomerwomen.com forward slash join dash the dash conversation. If you'd like to be a guest on podcast or know someone who'd make a great guest, there's an application form at the website too. And remember that we have monthly man day where I interview a man with a message for boomers. Bobby Kaler, thank you so much for being my guest today. I love being right. You are the ideal person to kick off 2022 <laughs> on Two Boomer Women. Thank you. Thank you. It's been such a joy talking with you. It's been a real treat. Thank you. And have a great rest of the week. You too.